Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle, and we are here to help you sound smarter when talking with your friends. And this is another edition of The Path to Libertarianism, where we talk to folks who are libertarians and have been for a long time and kind of discuss how they got from point A to point B. And uh, hopefully you see some of your journey and their journey. And I'm really excited to talk today to Dan Mitchell, who uh, who is a very prominent writer, very prominent scholar in the libertarian movement, somebody that I have read for a very long time. Uh, Dan, why don't you tell us a little bit about your day job? What are you doing now and where do you work? Well, Chris, uh, thanks for having me on your program. Uh, I'm uh, the chairman of the Center for Freedom and Prosperity, uh, which is a uh, small think tank. There's only three of us. Uh, It's been around since 2000. Uh, We started out focusing pretty exclusively on international issues. Uh, especially fighting against uh, bureaucracies that wanted tax harmonization. Uh, We were the only really significant defender of tax havens, Uh, but we've now branched out so that we cover all sorts of uh, market-oriented economic issues. Uh, Before being, I've been chairman of the Center for Freedom and Prosperity since the very beginning, but I didn't actually make it the place where I hung my hat until 2017. Before that, I was a, a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, before that, a senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation. And going way, way back into the distant past, I did a stint on Capitol Hill with Senator Bob Packwood and the Senate Finance Committee. And then I started with a small little group, Citizens for a Sound Economy, uh, a sort of a grassroots uh, libertarian organization. That's fascinating. Oh, and and, and I, sh- I guess I should say, even before that, uh, I got to the Washington area for the PhD program at George Mason University which of course is a, uh, if you believe in limited government and individual freedom, is a great place to pursue your higher education. Yeah, so you've had a long storied career in think tanks, which I don't know that a lot of our listeners fully understand, so we'll dive into that in a little bit. But let's start with when you were younger. I mean, were you interested in politics from a young age? Did you come from a political family? Uh, My my family was, you could probably say, conventional Republican uh, types, but uh, it wasn't a dinner table conversation or anything. Uh, What got me interested in public policy, uh, this will tell you how old I am, was the 1976 Reagan campaign. Uh, He challenged Gerald Ford for the Republican nomination. And even though I I don't even know how I got interested, uh, because it wasn't as if I was a regular watcher of the news, but somehow... I must have latched onto something. And Reagan, during that campaign challenge against President Ford, Reagan relentlessly mocked big government, talked about how government was the cause of problems. And for whatever reason, that resonated with me. And and I I can't remotely explain why it resonated with me, Uh, but I like that message. Uh, That was when I was a senior in high school. I then went off to college. I did my undergraduate work at the University of Georgia. Um, Back then, Young Americans for Freedom uh, was the only group I was aware of for libertarian-minded people. They also had plenty of conventional conservatives, of course, Uh, but I started the Young Americans for Freedom chapter. Uh, There was no internet back then, so the only things I knew to read uh, were things like National Review and Human Events. Uh, There were other things, of course, but I just didn't know about them. Uh, And so I, I slowly but surely began to read about things. And uh, I got exposed to enough material that I figured out, well, I'm not just a small government conservative, I'm really also a libertarian. Uh, And so I sort of learned a little bit about libertarianism. Uh, Ironically, I never read Ayn Rand until I was in graduate school. So so that usual entree point for a lot of people into the libertarian world uh, was not how I got involved. It It was all Ronald Reagan. Yeah, so let's explore that a little bit because you have kind of been at the founding in some ways or have been aware of the development of the conservative and the libertarian movements um, as an early watcher. What is the difference between National Review and some of the YAF, for instance, uh, and some of those conservative groups back when you were in college versus what you see now in the conservative movement and why do you think that there was a necessity for a libertarian movement or a separate wing to start to develop? Why was the Cato Institute, for instance, developed? Like, what, what has changed within some of those conservative outlets that you were uh, brought up on that has, has, has morphed and necessitated shows like this? 
Well, back in the 1970s and uh, early 80s, when I was learning about all this stuff, uh, there was, of course, widespread agreement among small government conservatives and libertarians about we need to cut back on the welfare state and just the size of government, the scope of government. Uh, uh, we wanted to shrink the federal government. There was unity on that. There was also unity on the notion that the Soviet Union and communism was bad and evil. Now, there wasn't necessarily unity uh, on how that should be addressed. Uh, some libertarians, of course, were, were very dovish. Uh, they were all anti-communist, but there was disagreement about how to address those issues. Now, since from the very beginning, I was always interested in the economic issues, uh, I'm not going to pretend that I was closely following, had my finger on the pulse of, uh, of the debates about foreign policy and stuff like that. I guess what first made me realize there was a difference between libertarians and small government conservatives was more some of the uh, issues such as you know, drug uh, criminalization. Uh, back then, you know, uh, you know, not that you know, I'm, I'm actually a boring kind of libertarian. I've never been a drug user, but I certainly was exposed to enough of it in high school and college, uh, was having friends that use drugs, knowing other people that use drugs. And I just remember thinking, now, I might not want to do that myself, but why should the government be arresting them, throwing them in jail? just because they're doing something that I might not like, but it's their body, their freedom. So, so just on a very simple, basic issue like that, that's when I understood that, oh, there's a difference between libertarians and the small government conservatives who otherwise I felt a great deal of, of kinship with. Okay, so you, you started with Ronald Reagan. I mean, did that admiration last through his two terms as president? Uh, this is a... I guess a strange story because I got to the Washington area for, uh, for GMU's uh, PhD program in the mid eighties. Uh, and so I was there in DC with Reagan in the white house. I started working almost right away part-time, but then full-time for citizens for a sound economy while working on my PhD. So I was writing on things, analyzing things, researching things while Reagan was still there. And I remember at the time, feeling, oh, he is such a disappointment. He's not doing enough. He's not fighting big government. Uh, and of course, in some objective sense, that's true. Have, however, with the benefit of all this gray hair I have, mm -hmm. and having seen the George H.W. Bush administration, having seen the George W. Bush administration, now seeing the Trump administration, uh, seeing other Republicans, uh, sometimes in control of Congress over the last several decades, I do now have, in retrospect, a lot of admiration for the fact that at least there was always some determination and fight in the Reagan administration to try to control government. Did they do it as much as I want it? Uh, no, of course not. But boy, compared to other Republican presidents, I now look back upon Reagan uh, with a lot of admiration, and I've actually crunched the numbers uh, in terms of who let government spending grow the fastest, I've crunched the numbers in terms of per capita, uh, inflation adjusted. I've, I've sort of segmented out looking just at domestic spending and things like that. There's a giant difference between Reagan and all the other Republican presidents. As a matter of fact, every other Republican president, uh, you know, even going back to like uh, Nixon before Reagan, but certainly everyone since Reagan, they've actually increased even domestic spending faster than like Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. So most Republican presidents wind up doing a really miserable job. Reagan stands out for having, compared to every other president in the modern era, at least slowed the growth of government. And because you slowed the growth of government, he wound up shrinking domestic spending as a share of GDP, and even shrinking overall spending as a share of GDP by one percentage point. So, so as time has gone by, I do appreciate Reagan more because at least there was some fight. Why would why would why did he have the ability to fight that maybe uh, I'm not going to pretend that Trump is ideological in any way or what was it about Reagan or the environment that was different then that doesn't seem to be possible for the Paul Ryan's in the Republican Party now? Well, first, let me say something, uh, I guess, in defense of Paul Ryan. In 2008, as Bush is heading out the door, uh, he, of course, is doing the TARP bailout. Uh, Obama gets elected. He does the, uh, the fake stimulus. 
uh, we have this sort of giant explosion in the size and scope of government just in a couple of years at the end of Bush, beginning of Obama. Uh, then Republicans, you know, we had that so-called Tea Party election in 2010. Mm -hmm. Republicans took the House. From 2010 to maybe about 2014, uh, if you look at the raw numbers, there was actually a tremendous amount of good stuff being done. Uh, we had a sequester in there. Uh, we, had a, we had a genuine commitment on the part of House leadership to fight. We had government shutdown battles. And if you simply look at that period, we actually, for the most part, had a nominal freeze on government spending, which was really impressive. Uh, so, so I don't want to say that every other Republican uh, certainly every other Republican president, but I don't want to say every other Republican was bad on spending because I do think House Republicans uh, back, and also back in 1994, the Gingrich Revolution, for a several year period, they were very good about fighting Bill Clinton on spending. And we actually made progress in terms of shrinking government as a share of GDP or economic output. And, and at the end of the day, of course, as a libertarian, I have my fantasies about wouldn't it be great if we shrunk the federal government back to what the founding fathers envisioned? Wouldn't it be great if we got rid of the Department of Agriculture, Department of Housing and Urban Development? Yes, I, I have that ultimate fantasy goal, but there's also such a thing as a partial victory. And if the private sector is growing faster than the government, guess what? We are shrinking the relative burden of government compared to the private sector that has to support that government. So, so I'm willing to take, um, partial victories because it's a lot better than partial defeats. Uh, so yes, other Republicans have been good at different times, but to finally answer your question after that uh, a little diversion there, Reagan actually wanted to do good things and he appointed at least enough people who wanted to do good things. The problem with say a president like Trump is that it's, it's easy to cut taxes because that's giving people their money back. And, and outside of the hard left, there's not going to be, there aren't going to be people who are going to really fight against that. And also, Trump is doing a semi-decent job on red tape. Not nearly as good of a job as he's telling us, but at least the, the rollout of new regulations has been abated. And there's actually been, in some areas, a few uh, bursts of deregulation. But again, that's not difficult to do. What's difficult to do is to tackle the interest groups that are feeding at the federal trough. Republicans and Democrats on Capitol Hill love it when there's more money to spend because that's how they raise campaign cash. That's how they make themselves popular. Oh, here's a bridge in the district. Here's a contract for a, uh, uh, for a, a, a factory in the district, whether it's to build tanks or to do something on the domestic side of the budget. It's very fun for a member of Congress to play Santa Claus with other people's money. And to have a president in the White House imposing some sort of overall discipline. Okay, you guys can waste money, but you can only let it grow 2% a year. Well, that's not happening with Trump. The budget's growing 4%, 5%, 6% a year, three times the rate of inflation. So it, it's, it does matter who's in the White House. Are they willing to fight? And unfortunately, on the issue of spending, Trump is a populist. Populists love spending other people's money. So that, that, that brought about like three different questions, but so it is possible. Let's, I, I'm from Indiana and we revere Mitch Daniels here, even us libertarians. When I was head of state party, we could never release a, a, a statement against his state of the state address. Uh, so if somebody like that got elected president, it is still possible that government could be reined in if the right person were elected to the White House, if we could get that person to run and win. Yes, but I say that uh, with a little bit of hesitation, because it's important to understand the different parts of the budget. There are three major parts of the federal budget. There's net interest on the debt, and that's pretty much uncontrollable unless someone thinks we should somehow default on the debt, which wouldn't be a good idea. It, mm -hmm. it, it is a contract the government has agreed to. I, I wish they hadn't at the time. I wish we hadn't borrowed and spent the extra money, but I don't believe in breaking contracts. So net interest, genuinely uncontrollable spending. Then you have what's called discretionary or appropriated spending. Uh, this is uh, both defense discretionary, the Pentagon budget, and it's also domestic discretionary. How much money are we giving to 
the Department of Housing and Urban Development? How much money are we giving to the Department of Education? Uh, a lot of the budget is funded on an annual basis through what's called these discretionary appropriations. The president, by use of the veto pen, has a lot of power to influence how fast that spending grows or even indeed whether it does grow. Uh, and that's one of the areas where Reagan did a really good job. Now, net interest, discretionary spending, now the elephant in the room, the entitlement budget, which you know, back when I was born was maybe only one fourth of the federal budget. It's now over 70% of the budget. This is social security, Medicaid, Medicare, uh, these are the so-called in budget walk terms, the mandatory programs, uh, their entitlements. You are legally uh, out, uh, you are legally given the right to get money if you fit a certain category based, based on your age, your health, your income levels. Uh, and in order to change those programs, because they are in, in budget parlance, they are permanently appropriated. In order to change those programs, you actually have to pass a law through the House and the Senate and a presidential signature in order to change it. So if, if we had a really good president who believed in limited government, that president couldn't really do anything about net interest, at least not in the short run. He can do something about discretionary spending, defense discretionary and domestic discretionary by virtue of the fact that he has a veto pen, but there's no way he can do anything about the entitlements unless he can somehow convince the House and the Senate to go along with plans. And you might remember uh, back in, uh, you know, back after the Tea Party took over, the House Republicans actually proposed budgets that would have block granted Medicaid, that would have shifted Medicare to a premium support system, similar to what federal employees have. Those two reforms would have dramatically saved money over the long run, but of course, Obama had no interest in controlling the size of government. So having the House pass a good budget was symbolic more than anything else. Now, I'm gonna digress here for a second. For much of the Obama years, the work I was doing in Washington was focused on one thing, get Republicans to support these budgets with the good entitlement reform so that if we happen to have a Republican president on January 20th, 2017, we could actually save the country from this long-term Greek-style fiscal crisis that we're heading toward. Well, we did get a Republican president. Unfortunately, out of 17 Republicans running for president in 2017, Republican voters picked the one guy who said, I'm not gonna touch the entitlement programs. And to me, that's probably the worst part. Well, the trade stuff is terrible, but in terms of fiscal policy, the worst part of Trump is that he has no interest in actually protecting the long run fiscal health of the country by dealing with entitlements. And of course, now that Democrats control the House, it's not like even if he suddenly had an epiphany, it's not like the Democrats in the House would pass anything anyhow. So we are just galloping in the wrong direction. Our aging population, falling birth rates, several hundred trillion dollars of unfunded liabilities uh, for these programs. So we really are looking at a long-term crisis. Uh, it really makes me worry about, you know, should I get my kids like Australian citizenship or something because mm. we're in such difficult long-term straits. Which is to, to invoke him again, Mitch Daniels recently said on local radio that a Democratic president is really going to be the only one that can rein in some of the entitlement spending. And I guess the, the crux, the concern of my question is really, how screwed are we? Do we need to get Australian citizenship? I think in the libertarian movement, and this is a long-standing feature of our movement, it's not a bug, is the, the fear of an economic collapse at any moment. Uh, how, how serious is that? How serious is the fiscal crisis facing the United States? Uh, and how bad could it be or... or because I never know, I, I never know, like, what is, what do I really need to worry about? Because I'm concerned about the budget. I'm concerned about spending. I'm concerned about entitlement. I'm concerned about those things. But I feel like there's a lot of people that I listen to that want me to be really afraid of it. And that seems to be a little manipulative. So, like, on a scale of one to 10, how concerned do you think Americans should be about a, a coming economic crisis? We should be concerned about a, an economic crisis, but not because of the budget. The, the budget that we have, the entitlement programs, the long-run growth and the burden of government spending because of those programs, 
that to me is like smoking three packs of cigarettes a day. Uh, you're not going to get cancer the first year in all likelihood or the second year or the third year. Uh, but sooner or later, smoking three packs of cigarettes a day is going to cause some negative health consequence. Uh, it might simply be uh, that instead of growing 3% a year, you're growing 1% a year, it's sort of turning America into France or Italy. When I think about an economic crisis, almost always in our nation's history, economic crises, uh, sort of the bust, the recessions, the depressions, almost always they have an origin with monetary policy. Now, I've done my best over the last 40 years not to focus too much on monetary policy just because it's not my interest. And also it's hard to really write and, and be a monetary policy person without people thinking you're a crank or something. Uh, oh, you're just one of these you know, gold bugs or crazy Fed bashers or something like that. Uh, well, the reality is though, the Fed usually is the cause of our economic crises. Uh, it played a significant role in the Great Depression. It played a big role with the dot-com bubble. It played a huge role with the 2008 crisis because when the Fed is pumping out easy money, artificially low interest rates, it's, it's causing what Austrian school economists uh, describe as a, as a it, it changes relative prices in a misleading way in the economy. You have malinvestment, you have bubbles. And frankly, I think, I fear, if I actually knew the answer to this, I'd be a billionaire living in the Cayman Islands, but I fear that we're in a bubble right now, that the Fed has just been keeping interest rates too low. Of course, Trump being a populist is, uh, is bashing uh, the Fed. Oh, you need to lower rates more. Uh, well, lowering rates is the government artificially distorting relative prices in the economy. Uh, all this extra money getting sloshed into financial markets around the world because it's not just the Fed, it's the European Central Bank, the Japanese Central Bank. I do worry there's a bubble. Uh, do I know enough about it to, to try to invest my paltry savings in a way to profit from it? No, I have no idea whether the bubble burst tomorrow or whether it'll burst two or three years from now. Or maybe somehow the Fed will do what's called a soft landing and gradually soak up this extra money without uh, an economic downturn. But it is a problem that we should be worried about. So it would be more like a 2008 downturn and less like a Great Depression where we're all eating out of trash cans and it's not necessarily the collapsitarian vision of what a downturn might look like? The key thing to realize about the Great Depression, it wasn't the, the bad Fed policy I guess was a, a main predicate of the Great Depression, but you have to look at the horrible mistakes that both Hoover and Roosevelt made that turned what otherwise would have been a normal banking panic recession into a Great Depression. Hoover raised the top tax rate from 25% to 63%. Hoover did the Smoot-Hawley tariff, which probably also helped to cause the stock market crash and to get the, the depression going. Hoover increased the burden of government spending by 50% in just four years. Uh, he got kicked out because he was doing a bad job. FDR comes in and what does he do? He doubles down basically on all of Hoover's bad policies. The tax rate went up further to 79%. Government spending doubled in an eight year period before World War II. You had all sorts of government intervention in terms of Roosevelt trying to cartelize the economy. He, he thought the problem was that prices weren't high enough. So, so you had massive statism under both Hoover and FDR. If we had an economic downturn today, a bubble bursting, frankly, I don't even, you know, maybe if Bernie Sanders was in the White House, you'd have completely idiotic policies getting enacted. But for the most part, I don't think you would see massive protectionism, massive tax rate increases, you'd probably see some misguided Obama style stimulus, but it wouldn't be nearly the increase in the burden of government spending we had under Hoover or FDR. So, so I actually think we have learned a little something uh, over the last 100 years, uh, just we haven't learned enough. Gotcha, okay. Well, I feel a little bit better now. Thank you, I appreciate that. Because listen, economics is not my main sphere of interest. I, I'm more of a foreign policy person and I enjoy you know, talking to people like you who have an, a, an understanding and appreciation of economics in a way that I don't. And, and I wonder, how did that develop? Was there, what are some of the early books or maybe mentors that you had that led you to a career of examining all this stuff that you got to do your passion on a daily basis? 
where did it all begin and what are some ways that people could, uh, if they're interested in doing the kind of work that you do, talk a little bit about your, your career path. Well, as I told you before, I got interested in public policy because of Reagan. And at the time, I thought that just meant I was a conservative. Uh, as I got to college and started reading National Review and human events and getting exposed to a few other things, I realized there was a, a subspecies called libertarians. And I began to understand, oh, that's what I really am. Uh, and I've always thought that libertarians and small government conservatives were, were natural allies. Uh, and so I've never objected to working with Republicans who actually have at least some degree of sincerity about controlling the size and scope of, uh, of Washington. Uh, now, in addition to National Review and Schumann events, uh, I did find the occasional book like Capitalism and Freedom by Milton Friedman, which I think is still uh, a relevant book for people to read. Uh, William Simon, who was Gerald Ford's treasury secretary, uh, he was sort of the token free market person in the Ford administration. He wrote a book, I think, called The Time for Truth, if my aging memory serves correctly. And that was actually a pretty good uh, book in terms of saying, you know, we need to control the size and scope of government. Um, I, I guess at other points in time, uh, eventually I learned about uh, uh, Henry Hazlitt, Economics in One Lesson. I remember reading that at some point in time. Um, I'm sure there were other things. Again, by the time I got into the master's program at the University of Georgia, uh, I read Atlas Shrugged. Uh, so, so Reagan was the uh, Reagan was my gateway drug uh, to being concerned about big government. Uh, and then I just sort of learned and got exposed to more over time. It would have been wonderful if there was an internet back then. I could have learned a lot more a lot faster. So did you get into working, uh, excuse me, what a way to phrase that question. So did you enter into the world of think tanks? Did you think that was even possible? Did you know what that was when you went to college? Did you have a direct career path or has it just kind of worked out organically? I had no idea there were things like think tanks. I mean, maybe I did because I'm sure when I was reading National Review and Human Events, they probably referenced the Heritage Foundation study, an American Enterprise Institute study, a Cato Institute study. So I, I probably vaguely had, had read things that mentioned think tanks. Uh, but at the time, uh, I, I, I definitely knew I wanted to work in the field of public policy. I actually thought that meant I wanted to work in politics. And at one point in time, I guess in 1979, uh, I went up to Washington, the Leadership Institute, which still exists, does training programs, especially targeted to young people. And the Reagan campaign offered to make me the, uh, the what, youth director or whatever it was called for Ohio for the Reagan campaign. And I remember having a, a very clear crossroads in my mind. Okay, do I want to work in politics? And for some reason, I said no. Uh, I, mean, I, I loved Reagan. I was very excited about the Reagan campaign. Uh, but I remember thinking, wait, is, when I was actually forced to think about it and make a choice, I remember thinking, no, I don't, I don't want to work in politics. I want to work in public policy. So I stayed at Georgia, then went to graduate school for my master's. I uh, had to take all sorts of math and statistics because I had avoided that as an undergraduate, as well as, of course, the graduate programs. And again, as part of my slow learning process of what's going on around the world, uh, I learned about George Mason University, which is where all the Austrian school people were. It's where the public choice people like James Buchanan were. That's the, that's the economic school of thought that analyzes the self-interested behavior of politicians and bureaucrats. And so I realized, wait, George Mason is where I should be. I applied for the PhD program. I went to George Mason. And once I got up to Washington, then I began to realize that, okay, there's this whole world of think tanks. Uh, some of the professors at George Mason were involved in this group that was started, Citizens for a Sound Economy, which is sort of a libertarian grassroots group at the time. It actually, it's morphed in several ways, and part of it is now Americans for Prosperity, just for, mm -hmm. for, uh, for your uh, viewers who might uh, uh, know about them. But anyhow, so once I started working part-time and then full-time at Citizens for a Sound Economy, then I got exposed, of course, to the Cato Institute, the Heritage Foundation, uh, other places, uh, and 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 that was my that's where I belonged. I belonged for whatever dorky reason. I belonged in Washington, 
writing about fiscal policy, especially, but also you know, over the years, I've written about regulation, monetary policy. Over the last couple of years with Trump's awful approach, I've written a lot about trade policy, but fiscal policy has always been uh, my top area of interest for whatever reason. So I don't think people understand what a think tank does or is necessarily or what you do. I think in their mind, you sit around smoking a pipe in a big high back leather chair next to a fire reading all day. What does it look like when you work in a think tank? What goes on on a daily basis for you? Well, some of it is exactly what you described. If you looked at a think tank such as, say, the American Enterprise Institute, that's, they focus more on sort of long-term thinking, uh, writing books, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and there's definitely a role for that. So they are sitting with those high back le leather chairs. I don't know if they have fireplaces going, uh, but they tend to more be writing books. Uh, I was at the Heritage Foundation for 17 years. The Heritage Foundation, there are definitely plenty of longer publications, but a lot of what the Heritage Foundation focuses on, and again, I, I was a libertarian in the economic policy area of, uh, of Heritage, uh, and they were small government focused for the most part. So, so as a libertarian, I certainly felt comfortable during my years at Heritage. Uh, I mean, were there some big government conservatives there? Yes. Uh, and there were certainly internal battles. Uh, but by and large, I was sort of left unmolested to do lots of writing, uh, to lots of activity on Capitol Hill with members of Congress and their staff, basically trying to educate them about why we would be better with lower tax rates and smaller government. Then I went, when I went to Cato, Cato wasn't nearly as focused on Capitol Hill, uh, but it was definitely focused on getting out a consistent, coherent libertarian message about why government should be smaller in every uh, sphere of our lives. That's excellent. Yeah, I think uh, there's some wing of the libertarian movement that criticizes think tanks because, oh, that's the swamp. That's the, or Tea Party conservatives too. That's the swamp. That's where all these bad ideas are constantly pushed. And the Council on Foreign Relations will be cited a lot, or Brookings. And they're the ones pushing these bad ideas and interventionism. And they're just funded by uh, security, a, a security companies to basically sell more bombs. I mean, so I think for some libertarians, the idea of uh, a professional institutionalized bank of knowledge is somewhat threatening. But in my experience, it, it seems like it's really necessary in a free society to have people who are dedicated to public policy and writing about it. And if you don't like one, that's sort of what the Koch brothers and George Soros have just done. They said, there's too many interventionist think tanks. We're going to start the first non-interventionist think tank. And when you start a think tank, I mean, how much can you, in that instance or in, in the places that you've worked, how much can you actually influence public policy? Is it as direct and nefarious as maybe some people think? Or is it like, we're just throwing out a bunch of ideas and hoping some of this stuff st sticks with the people who actually make decisions? Let me start by saying the people you described, the libertarians who are suspicious of Washington, they should be suspicious. <laughs> uh, it's always good to have a healthy skepticism of everything in Washington, because there are some people who go to Washington thinking, I'm going to try to save the world, and they do wind up getting absorbed by the swamp. It's sort of like the Borg. They get sort of just swept into Washington. And you can, I mean, I have plenty of people that I know who came to Washington to go work on Republican staffs who are committed free market people, and now they're basically lobbyists who will if you give them a check, they'll lobby to make government bigger. And they sort of lost, they, they've lost the focus uh, for, and then the commitment for individual liberty. They're, they're probably still Republicans. They probably still give to Republican uh, campaigns, including some who are candidates who are free market oriented. So I don't want to say that they've completely lost their souls, but there's definitely pressure once you get to Washington to go along, to get along. If you want your kids in private school, you want a house with a big mortgage in a nice neighborhood. I mean, there is a lot of pressure to do the wrong thing. Now, having said that, for the most part, I think the think tanks, at least that I was uh, working with, uh, Heritage and Cato, have for the most part kept their, themselves relatively clean. Uh, I think there are other think tanks and organizations like 
Competitive Enterprise Institute, the National Taxpayers Union, Americans for Tax Reform, my own little group, Center for Freedom and Prosperity. There are plenty of groups in Washington who I think have kept their honor and continue to fight for the right thing. Uh, it just It's always very important in an organization working in Washington that you find people to work there who not only know their material, but also sort of have enough moral fiber not to get uh, co-opted by the swamp. So how do you maintain your own, and I hate to use this word, purity? Is it just the people that you surround yourself with on a daily basis? It, for whatever reason, I, I've always been, uh, you know, the awful word, ideologue. I, I've always woken up every day uh, just believing that government should be smaller. Uh, I'll, I'll read the news every morning, and I'll still get upset when I read about uh, misguided government programs that are hurting the economy, that are hurting people. Uh, I'll read stories, uh, uh, you, know, you know, Reason Magazine about how I individuals are being abused and exploited by, by things like bad drug laws, uh, by asset forfeiture laws. I mean, I still have, you know, whatever that knee-jerk reflex is that makes us libertarians, I still get just incredibly angry and upset uh, when I hear and I read about and see how government is hurting us. And of course, you know, because I'm the fiscal policy person and because I have three kids, I, I, I can't help but every day get upset at the notion that we are slowly drifting into becoming a Greek style welfare state because of the entitlements and changes in the demographics of the country. And that upsets me. I, I, I suppose logically it, it would be wonderful if I just didn't care. I could go just do some regular job and business probably make more money, uh, but I care about this stuff. Um, and one of the things I've always done over my life in think tanks is I try to figure out, is there, is there some switch that I can flip? Is there some argument I can make that will get more people to care? Because if we don't get more people concerned about this, we don't get more people involved and agitated, uh, frankly, I think we're gonna lose our country. Yeah, the, there was a woman who once asked Buckley how he knew what to write about in his columns, and he said, I wake up and read the news, and whatever pisses me off the most, I write about that. So sounds like you're in good company with, with William F. Buckley. And that leads me to my next question is your ideological diet. I mean, how does somebody get as smart as you? I mean, are you, you, do you watch television at all, or do you just read books all the time? What sort of things do you read? What sort of resources do you recommend to people if, if people out there want to – consume information and try to be as smart as you, how do they do that? Well, self-interestedly, in a self-interested fashion, I'm gonna first recommend to read my daily column. Uh, if you go to any search engine, type in Dan Mitchell blog, you'll get to my blog, which is called International Liberty, danieljmitchell.wordpress.com. Which but, I will link in the show notes. Yeah, every single day. I mean, literally, including holidays. I mean, it's now my, my, it's now my shtick. I write a column, uh, and the column, usually fiscal policy, almost always economic policy, but occasionally I write about the drug war and asset forfeiture and foreign policy interventionism and other things like that. But I'm writing some column where I like to at least think I'm making a coherent point about some failure of government policy or about the benefits of some reform to shrink government, uh, giving some genuinely concrete data along with some rigorous analysis. I like to think that the niche I've carved out is that um, I'm definitely ideological and I sometimes I'll, I will foam at the mouth and just really be, you can sense that I'm angry when I'm writing about something, especially when I deal with things like asset forfeiture, but I'm also trying to make sure I'm giving people the right argument about why government is a misguided, why we should shrink government. I like to think that I have plenty of rigor. I've written probably now close to 6,000 columns on my blog, and I can only think of maybe four or five where I made a genuine meaningful mistake. Uh, so I think my 35, 40 years of working on this stuff, uh, I, uh, I, I like to think that I have a good store of knowledge, a good base of knowledge, and I like to think that there's enough rigor and honesty and accuracy in my columns that for people who are interested in these things, uh, it's a good way to spend five minutes every day reading the column and learning about something about how government is making our lives uh, less fruitful. 
What do you read on a daily basis that helps you fill that cup? I probably have about 50 different emails that automatically come in every day from different news sources. Uh, I get daily emails from Reason Magazine, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, New York Times, all, all sorts of different uh, you know, Capitol Hill publications like The Hill newspaper. So, and of course I also have Twitter. Uh, which I mostly use. I, I don't actually follow that many people because you can just get totally bogged down, but I follow an odd little assortment of people. By the way, I'm at, at Daniel J. Mitchell for people who are on Twitter, but I use it so that I know that with these people, if I'm just going down on my phone, if there's something happening in the world that I should know about, I feel very confident with sort of the interesting cross-section of uh, 20 odd people that I follow. I feel confident I'll know about it between that and these 50 plus emails that I get in every day. And so when I wake up in the morning, as you were talking about William F. Buckley, first thing I'm doing is I'm going through, okay, what's in the news from the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the Wall Street Journal editorial page, of course, I think is a very good source of good information on economic policy. Uh, sometimes I'm finding something to write about for my daily column. Sometimes I already know because of some research that I'm doing. Um, but it's, there's probably at least five to six hours of reading every day uh, involved with what uh, the kind of work I'm doing. So do you read a lot of books in that? I mean, that six hours, is it a lot of just current news or are you reading several books a day or, or you know, I, what, what is your, what kind of book reading life, I guess, do you have? I probably don't do as much book reading as I should. Uh, I'm of course consuming a lot of news. Uh, but I'm also consuming a lot of reports. Uh, I, I don't like, say, I'll give you an example, I don't like the ideological approach of, say, the International Monetary Fund, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the World Bank, and things like that. But I wind up reading a lot of the reports because while they might be have a misguided policy agenda, the work tends to be rigorous and, uh, and, and well-founded in the sense of, honest, accurate, albeit from a more left of center perspective. Uh, so I read a lot of reports from these international organizations because they will focus on issues that I care about. I'll read reports from uh, all sorts of think tanks, uh, not just the ones that are right of center uh, and in favor of smaller government, but also some of the ones that are left of center. Uh, there are really some key issues uh, in terms of fiscal policy um, should we care about inequality? Uh, and there's lots of think tanks writing lots of studies on inequality. My view, and I've written about this dozens of times on my blog, is that we shouldn't care about inequality. We should care about opportunity and poverty reduction. And if you care about opportunity and growth and poverty reduction, that leads you toward free market policies, where if you sort of view the economy as a fixed pie and you care about inequality, that leads you to a class warfare redistributionist agenda. So reading about the, the whole wealth of material that comes out uh, on that kind of topic is, a, is of course, can take up, you know, that could literally be every day for the rest of my life if I wanted to read every single thing that was written about those things. Another very interesting difference is on, uh, on fiscal policy. Left and right, Republican and Democrat, everyone says they care about the deficit. No, they don't. That's really a proxy for the real fight. The real fight is about the size of government. And so what I tell a lot of my Republican friends, uh, and for that matter, some of my sort of free market oriented think tank friends, we shouldn't be writing about the deficit being a problem. The deficit is a symptom of the problem. The real problem is government's too big and growing too fast. And the, and the analogy I always give them, or I guess the, 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 the question I pose to them is, if somehow magically, $2 trillion of revenue floated down from heaven. And in Washington, instead of having a trillion dollar deficit, had a trillion dollar surplus. Would that change our argument at all about why we should get rid of the Department of Education? No. Would that change at all the fact that we should be block granting Medicaid and getting it out of Washington? No. We should be focusing on the size of government. If we talk about, oh, we have to reduce the deficit, Bernie Sanders can say, okay, that's a good idea. Let's raise taxes. Anytime you see a Republican, a conservative, or a libertarian talking about the deficit, you should slap them on the hand and say, no, you should be talking about our problem is government being too 
big. And so I do a lot of research and writing about sort of these macroeconomic fiscal policy issues. One of my big uh, topics, uh, and I'll shut up on this because I know I'm filibustering again. Oh, keep One going. of my big topics is I write a lot about why we should have a spending cap, not a balanced budget amendment. A balanced budget amendment, you, know, you have those in California and Illinois. Do those stop bad fiscal policy? No. You have the so-called Maastricht criteria, anti-deficit rules in Europe. Does that stop Italy and Greece and France from having bad fiscal policy? No. What we should focus on, what should be our agenda, whether you're a small government conservative or a libertarian, the agenda should be to have a spending cap like they have in Switzerland or Hong Kong, which says that government can't grow faster than the economy's private sector. So if you look at the debt ceiling, they just keep moving that line. Wouldn't they keep moving the line? If you have a spending cap, and assuming, of course, and by the way, they also have one in Colorado, the so-called TABOR, Taxpayer Bill of Rights. It's actually a spending cap. Uh, what spending caps do is they tell politicians, look, every single year, you get to spend more money, but in nominal terms, maybe the budget can only grow 2% a year. And as long as your private economy on average, because of course there'll, there'll be recessions, there'll be boom years and stuff like that. But if the nominal GDP, private economy on average is growing 4% a year, and your nominal government spending is only growing 2% a year, guess what's happening over time? You are slowly but surely shrinking the burden of government spending as a share of GDP. And, and for the few jurisdictions around the world that have these spending caps, they actually work. Whereas all over the world, where there are anti-deficit rules, balanced budget rules, they don't work. And, and let me give you the technical reason for that. We have a business cycle, usually caused by government, but we have it. And so what happens when there's a recession? Revenues fall. Are politicians gonna cut spending in a recession? No, that's exactly the point in time when they think they should spend more money, usually for misguided Keynesian reasons, sometimes just because they wanna buy votes. Uh, maybe they actually care about people, but they're misguided in, in their approach of how you actually help people. But when there's a recession and revenues fall, they're not gonna cut spending. Now, what happens when the economy is really growing fast? and maybe revenues are increasing eight, nine, 10% a year. With a balanced budget rule, they can increase spending eight, nine, 10% a year. The beauty of a spending cap is it tells the politicians, hey, you don't have to cut spending in a recession. You can still increase spending by 2% a year. But the trade-off is that when the economy is growing and they're getting all this extra revenue coming in, they can't spend it. Mm. And they can still only grow 2% a year. And, and again, I would recommend people go to International Liberty, my blog. I have all sorts of, you know, not just scholarly, but also I, I go through this material and I break it down into simple common sense observations. You don't need to be an economics PhD or even a, an economics graduate uh, to understand these things. Most economic concepts are very simple and straightforward. It's just that most economists use a lot of jargon so they can try to portray themselves as being smart. Mm -hmm. I view one of my niches in life is how do I give these economic concepts and data in ways that ordinary people who are living otherwise ordinary lives who don't have time to focus on all the jargon and nonsense, I break it down and explain, this is what's really happening. This is why we should care. Here's some of the data, and here's the policy prescription that comes from that data. Yeah, that's why you've always been one of my favorite reads and one of the people I've recommended first and foremost, uh, because you are such a clear writer. You, you do make it very simple, and that seems to be uh, lost. And, and that's so funny that you say that, that people try to be the smartest in the room. You're trying to do a lot of what we do here, which is just help regular people, normies, understand complicated concepts. And so I highly recommend his blog. Like I said, it will be in the show notes. So just click that link and bookmark it. I don't know if you have a Facebook page or an email list, or I'm not sure how you distribute it. Um, it, it well, do you have an email list? Like how, how is the, what is the best way to get that delivered to us every day? Well, anybody who follows me on Twitter at Daniel J. Mitchell, I automatically send out my blog every day on Twitter. Uh, on Facebook, I have, uh, I, I have uh, a couple of pages, one being a, I don't know, Dan Mitchell Economist page. It's like a, a, an institutional page. And then I have my personal page. If you just search for Dan Mitchell on Facebook, presumably you'll find me. Uh, but then if you simply go to the blog, somewhere on the top right, you can put in your email, which by the way, I never use for anything else. 
you can put in your email and automatically every day when my column gets published, it shows up in your inbox. Uh, it's free, of course. Uh, I disseminate all this material uh, to try to help save the country, not to fatten my bank account. Uh, nothing wrong with fattening bank accounts, but um, since I'm an ideologue, I want people to get this information and learn more about these issues. So there's several ways of getting it, but the simplest way is probably just put your email into the into the into uh, that little box and it automatically shows up in your inbox every day. So let's finish up with talking about the 2020 race. Let's start with Trump, who seems to take uh, an enormous amount of credit for the current economy. And you always sort of hear, oh, well, presidents can't affect the economy that much, and he's taking too much credit. This is Obama's economy still. How much uh, does a president really affect the economy, and is Trump affecting it in a good or a bad way? Well, that, that's a that's a, a question with a lot of uh, aspects it's, to it. It's a very broad question, I know, but that's sort of how people ask it, and maybe you can help us well, pack for, it a little. First, I'll agree with the point that you were making, that the economy tends to be sort of this big ocean liner, uh, you know, going through the ocean, and politicians are like tugboats. Now, <laughs> over time, Big enough tugboats, enough tugboats can change the direction of a big ocean liner or big aircraft carrier. So I think public policy does affect the economy. There's no question about it. And presidents can have a positive effect or a negative effect. In terms of Trump specifically, well, first, if you look at the last four years of, of Obama in terms of the economy's trend lines with what we've seen over three years of Trump, frankly, there's not that much of a difference. Uh, it does appear that Trump has bumped the numbers up a little bit, but then the question becomes, is that because of his policy or because he's just badgering the Fed for easy money, which in the short run feels good. Uh, you know, easy money from the Fed is like, hey, I'm taking another drink at the bar. Uh, well, the problem is when you get the hangover, that's when you have the economic bust from the easy money policies. So, so there's a big argument about how much credit should Trump get? And is it because his policy is good or because the Fed is, is giving us the fake stimulus of easy money. Uh, I'll simply say, if we separate monetary policy out of the equation, the way I describe Trump is that he's good on some issues and he's bad on some issues. Uh, if I wake up and I'm thinking I'm Dan Mitchell, the tax guy, for the most part, I think Trump's policy has been good. His tax cut was made the law better or less destructive, I guess, if we want to get technical. If I'm Dan Mitchell, the budget guy, and I'm wearing that hat, Trump's a big spender. He's, he's increasing even domestic spending at a faster rate than Obama or Bill Clinton or even Jimmy Carter did. If I'm Dan Mitchell, the regulatory guy wearing that hat, well, Trump has moved policy in the right direction. But if I'm Dan Mitchell, the trade guy, Trump has been absolutely terrible. Uh, his protectionism has been from, from a wrong theoretical approach, uh, he's dealing with the issue in the wrong way. It's, it's just incredibly frustrating that he is so clueless about how international trade works. He, he, he's worse than, than a high school student getting a D minus on a test when it comes to trade. He actually thinks trade is a zero sum game. He, he genuinely seems to think the rest of the world is somehow trying to cheat us as opposed to trade simply being a function of the fact that individuals and companies all over the world are engaging in voluntary transactions. And he doesn't understand that when we buy more from, a foreign, from businesses in a foreign country than they buy from us, those dollars just don't sit there stuffed under a mattress. They come back to the US in the form of more investment in our economy. As a matter of fact, that might actually be the driving force because foreigners want to invest in our economy, because why would you invest in France or China? Uh, if people want to invest in the US economy, they have to sell us stuff to earn dollars. So, so Trump is just a disaster on trade. Uh, but again, he's good on a couple of issues. And as I said, he's bad on a couple of issues. Uh, so uh, I never know what grade to give him because he's such an, if I was a student, I mean a teacher and he was my student, I would say, boy, he gets A's and B's in some areas, but D's and F's in other areas. Okay, well, very good. So what about, so let's just talk about Bernie and Bloomberg, because that's where I assume we're headed in terms of a, an election. I mean, maybe Warren will pop through, but I'm sure um, her and Bernie have such close policies. So let's start with Bernie, the front runner. Should Bernie become president, Bernie Sanders? How disastrous could that be for the economy, or am I just overblowing it because he's a socialist and I'm a libertarian? Uh, Bernie Sanders, 
I think deep down is a truly horrible statist. I think he really does believe this socialist Marxist claptrap. Uh, that's been his record his entire life. I, my column yesterday was looking at, at his long-term record and some of the incredible, odious, uh, noxious, uh, uh, you know, pro-dictatorship, pro-socialism, pro-Marxist sentiments that he's expressed his entire life. If he was president, that would be a train wreck for our economy. Now, the one saving grace is that our founding fathers bequeathed to us a separation of power system. And so even if somehow the Democrats were in control of the House, the Senate, and the White House with Bernie Sanders as president after 2020, it would still be very difficult for him to get through the Green New Deal, which is central planning on steroids. It would be very difficult for him to get through Medicare for All, which is the British NHS on steroids. There are all sorts of really bad things he wants to do that even with the expansive view of executive power that Obama and Trump had, there's no way that those things can happen without legislation moving through the House and Senate. And you're not going to get 60 votes because uh, e even a, in a very, very good election for the Democrats, yes, they could pick up the Yeah, they could pick up the Senate. Oh, I don't know. But, but they wouldn't have 60 votes in the Senate. And, yeah. and so, so there would be some constraint on Bernie Sanders. Um, but how much? Who knows? Well, my fear for him is is that he would do a lot of what Obama and Trump have done and use executive action to implement a lot of things. I mean, is that a concern that you have about Sanders? Yes, there's no question he would fill the regulatory agencies with complete collectivist, statist mindset people. Uh, you would have the executive power of the White House being used to expand government's power and control over our lives. He would be a terrible president, uh, but again, he would not achieve nearly as much as he wants to achieve. But nonetheless, what he would achieve would, would in effect, be a big ratchet uh, uh, upwards in terms of government's control over our economy and over our lives. So let's take a look at Bloomberg. Uh, I don't know if you've looked at his record in New York City and what kind of president he may be. He seems to be uh, not not that far off from Bernie or Trump in that he wants to control whatever he can control. Uh, what kind of president do you think he would be economically? Bloomberg would be a technocrat. And by that, I mean, he, he, he in his own mind, he would be a practical person. Uh, and But it, of course, all depends on his underlying biases. So he might be trying to tell us how much salt we could put on our food or or what kind of soda we can drink. Uh, he would raise taxes, but he wouldn't be crazy about raising taxes like Bernie. Bernie Sanders genuinely hates economic success. He genuinely hates capitalism. Bloomberg doesn't hate capitalism. He just thinks, oh, I'm going to, I want the government to, uh, to get the rewards of capitalism. I want government to be the one that sort of grabs the lion's share of any additional economic growth that the private sector generates. Uh, but when he was in as mayor of New York, he was semi-good on welfare reform. He was semi-good on at least charter schools. And he sort of realizes that the government education monopoly has done a terrible job. So he wouldn't be horrible on that issue. Of course, he might appoint a terrible education uh, secretary. So he might wind up being horrible. But then again, he might appoint someone who was halfway decent. So, so Bloomberg would be a mixed bag in the same way that Trump is a mixed bag. It would just be different issues. Bloomberg would be, I'm sure, much better on trade. Uh, he would probably be better on spending uh, because it'd be hard to be worse than Trump. Uh, but he, he would be bad on taxes. Uh, on regulation, I assume he would, by and large, leave things alone. Now, he is taking, for purposes of the Democratic race, he is taking positions and adopting positions that I think are further to the left than he really is. Mm. Excellent. Well, Daniel Mitchell, thank you so much for your time. This has been great. Is there anything else that you'd like to say to the audience that we may have missed? All I would say is that even though it seems hopeless, we have to keep fighting. Uh, our country depends on it. For those of us who have children and at some point grandchildren, uh, you know, we're one of the, we don't have freedom in the way we libertarians want, but by world standards, we have a lot of freedom and that's worth defending and fighting for. And so even though every day I sometimes feel like I'm banging my head against the wall, I'm going to keep fighting and I urge everyone else out there 
share material, learn more, uh, without being annoying, try to educate your friends and colleagues uh, so that we have a chance of turning the country around and saving uh, what our founding fathers bequeathed to us. Well, that's wonderful. And we're all trying to work on not being annoying. But that, <laughs> so I really appreciate your time. And I thank you for kind of helping give people a template to do exactly what you just said. And uh, uh, go read his blog, sign up for his email newsletter, and get his blog post every day. He has been one of my favorite reads for such a long time. Dan Mitchell, thanks so much. Hey, well, thanks for having me on the program. It was great talking to you. All right, everybody, thank you so much for listening, and we will talk to you next week.